Hello, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, everybody. My name is Chris Kloss, and this is Extreme Memories. Brought to you by the Wrestling Chatter channel here on the web. And uh, we're going to kick this show off, our debut show, talking about everything extreme with an X. That's right, Extreme Pro Wrestling XPW. There's been a lot of renewed interest in the last few months. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about why this renewed interest, uh, which relates to shows like The Dark Side of the Ring, uh, people that we knew, uh, some unfortunate passings in the past couple months, and um, all things XPW, all things extreme. Again, my name is Chris Kloss. If you happen to know who I am, I was the host and the announcer from day one all the way until the end. And with me right now, the brains behind the operation. His one, title one, was vice. Well, one his of the, title was. One of the I, I I think I think you took a large percentage of the brains that went into XPW, and I could say that from uh, working with you, working with XPW. But this is he was known as the vice president of operations, Mr. Kevin Kleinrock, sir. How are you doing this evening, man? I'm I'm doing I'm doing all right. All things considered, in the middle of uh, the insanity that is our our world right now, I'm doing all right. That's right. We're both in our respective uh, homes, and we're not physically together. So don't worry, fans. The social distance <laughs> is in effect. Yeah, about six hundred uh, miles or whatever, three hundred miles or whatever. Between. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We're we're in the same state, but not too close to each other. But this is going to be extreme memories, uh, Kevin. You know, why don't we kick it off and and talk about XPW? Not not all before we get into the impact of XPW stream wrestling, where we stood in the landscape uh, within the professional wrestling industry at the time. But let's talk about the genesis of XPW. How, in your mind, in your thoughts, do you see that this thing came about? Well, when I was fourteen, so you were old. there. Uh, when I when I was about 13, 14 years old, I first attended a show at Slammer's Wrestling Gym, and there was this really obnoxious guy in the crowd, and he would not shut up at the wrestlers. And, oh, wait. Oh, yeah, that's right. It was you. Uh, that was me. And, uh, that was me. Uh, so, I mean, really, the, so the genesis in 30 seconds is there's a group of us in Southern California who uh, had, after some other things, uh, got together and were doing a rinky-dink, very small wrestling promotion called Southern California Championship Wrestling, just like SCCW. your average indie. Yep, SCCW. We were doing shows at Boys and Girls Clubs and, you know, rec centers and things of that nature. Uh, it was uh, the, the late Dynamite D, the legendary SoCal referee Patrick Hernandez, and uh, myself who were uh, uh, running that. I was, at that point in time, 18 years old and uh, just starting college. And um, what, year? what year? 96. 90, okay. this, is, this is like 90, definitely 97. Maybe it started in 96. I don't remember exactly. Okay. Um, okay. But in the summer of 19, right before summer of 1998, uh, mm -hmm. we were getting ready to do a show. And as we did, we would hit up WWE events, pass out flyers for our shows, you know, old school promoting back mm -hmm. before, uh, you only had, you know, people think you can only, you know, promote shows on the internet and they'll be successful. Uh, and that night, uh, a guy by the name of Rob Black happened to, uh, get a flyer for one of our shows. And he was, uh, at the event with, uh, another guy named Gene Ross. Uh, and they, they got the flyer and Rob had been working. Um, so Rob has had an adult uh, entertainment company, uh, but he had, uh, always liked pro wrestling and had been a, a, a fan, uh, kind of, kind of from back in the day. Uh, and he had met a number of ECW wrestlers and, uh, uh, uh appearances that they had made, um, uh, in the New York area. And that's where his family's from. Right. And uh, he had been talking to Paul Heyman at the time about maybe doing something with, with uh, ECW on the West Coast. Uh, maybe he wanted to do something on his own. But um, Rob knew all about WWE 
WCW, ECW, but didn't really know about the independent wrestling scene. Didn't right. know that there was anybody already doing wrestling in the Los Angeles area. Uh, and so he wanted to talk with us. And we uh, met at the TGI Fridays and talked for hours and hours and hours. Um, and, you know, I always say that um, I'm really glad that Rob never saw an SCCW show because I think he would have <laughs> ran in the opposite direction if he saw, like, just how small these SCCW shows were. Um, so, uh, but we, we thought there was a lot of great potential, uh, and we were really faced with the decision, you know, do we continue doing SCCW on our own with the money that was out of D and Pat pockets? Cause again, I'm in college and I don't have really disposable income, uh, to spend on, on a wrestling promotion. Or do and we, I, and I, and I was, and I was delivering pizzas at the time, so I didn't have the income either. Uh, you know, do we, um, you know, try to team up with uh, this guy who had a lot of ideas and uh, a personality that was just bigger than uh, most pro wrestlers? And right. we uh, we decided that it made most sense to take the gamble and um, try to do something, with Rob. And it was a whole nother year before right. you know, mm-hmm. even. So, I mean, at that point, there was no thought of. We're going to do a promotion. It's going to be called XW. Um, and right. we, we just knew that something might happen. And over time, we were talking more and more about, um, you know, what could be done and what could happen. And but Rob was still working with Paul and talking to Paul yeah. and figuring mm-hmm. out what might, what might work between him and Paul. Um, Rob also had a company in Brazil. And there was talk about trying to maybe get ECW out to Brazil and on TV in Brazil. Uh, uh, and happened and was this would, would have been probably 1999 uh, when Paul was negotiating with Tim to bring uh, ECW to national television what happened was when Paul Heyman started talking with uh, TNN about bringing ECW to the network he right. kind of disavowed any knowledge or connection to Rob Black. And right. uh, that led to Rob saying, now it's go time. Uh, now, not only are we going to do a wrestling company, but we're going to go with that XPW name that we were going to do. And originally the X and XPW, which was uh, actually named by Sheldon Goldberg. Wrestling right. Story I remember that. Motor, yep. That's uh, it was, it, it was just going to be an X. It was just going to be the X factor. It was going to be something new and different and crazy. Um, no different, no different than the XFL not standing for anything. Right. Or the original yeah. TNA X division or wrestling society mm-hmm. X. Um, and, but then when, when, when Paul, you know, kind of Rob who uh, Rob was like, F it, we're going to call this extreme. It's going to be extreme pro wrestling. And that's, that's what launched XPW. And, I don't remember what month that was in, uh, but July of 1999, we uh, we did our first show. So it, pro- it was probably early 1999, um, you know, uh, right. winter, spring 1999, that uh, that that all went down. And and coincidentally enough, this show is airing right now uh, on the 21st anniversary. So it was 21 oh, years crazy. ago today. Oh, happy birthday, Webb! By the yes. way. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's that's how we all remembered his birthday. But uh, yeah, it was July thirty first, nineteen ninety nine, was the um, the debut show in the historic at the time Reseda Country Club. If people know Southern California, specifically the San Fernando Valley, when you bring up the Reseda Country Club, I mean, you talk about all these legendary acts that performed there, and kind of the the movie Boogie Nights kind of uh, exemplifies that a little bit. How that was really the hub of the San Fernando Valley, if you're not in the city of LA, the Reseda Country Club was the place to be for all events and and some underground events too. People that uh, wouldn't necessarily perform, let's say in, in the city of LA, the West Side or downtown, anywhere like that, you could see them out at the Reseda Country Club. So the place was very renowned. It was very historic by the time we went in there. And it was it was funny how we kind of bookended that venue with wrestling because uh, Speaking of Dark Side of the Ring uh, with Herb Abrams, UWF, like he got in there right when 1990 hit 
and we kind of bookended it with uh, 1999. And both those were pretty impactful um, leagues in professional wrestling at the time. And now I want to ask you, you, you speak of XPW, Rob wanting to keep the name extreme, coming from Sheldon Goldberg, I remember that. But um, what, was, what was in your mind the difference, the, the making it different from ECW? Because personally, when I talk to people or people ask me questions, I, I feel like we get a little bit of an unfair uh, comparison to them. Like we were just basically the exact same thing as them. And in some ways, you know, they have points, but in other ways, we were our own entity. We were our own uh, faction league, uh, but we were still professional wrestling. And it was hard to, it was, it was hard to totally be different when we were doing matches of that uh, caliber of, of extreme matches, barbed wire, all that stuff. So um, what, what in your minds was, uh, how did you, how did you go about trying to make it different than ECW? Well, I think you can't look at XPW from day one and to the end as the same thing. Um, oh, right, you know, right. there's no doubt. Listen, those, that first show, those first shows, that first, uh, hardcore conception VHS tape that never made DVD because of this very reason it was, you know, Rob's vision was, let's let's give the west coast their ecw and if if ecw had just broken three tables on a show we were going to break four and if uh you know ecw yeah. had done this type of a gimmick we were going to do this type of a gimmick and you know we brought in a lot of a lot of former ecw names you know from big dick dudley and missy hyatt and uh you know axel rotten and, and, and uh, uh the pit bulls and and i think that so at first the very very first few months it really was. Let's give the West Coast an ECW flavored show. Yeah. But that became kind of uh, a lot of fans who, especially if they were ECW fans west of the Mississippi, they saw that version of, of XPW and they never were willing to look at what happened next, what it evolved right. to. Because by the time we got to television, I think, man, I, it, it's funny because. In a in the day and age where you can pretty much find everything on YouTube, it's funny to me that like nobody's ever put up all 130 episodes of XPW TV on YouTube. Now I'm glad they haven't right. because hopefully either Rob or the or, or, or the you know, the the people who bought the content um you know can do something with it someday and and you know uh, make some money with it. But XPW TV, if you start our history kind of there. I stand by it today as the yeah. best independent wrestling television series that has ever been done. We totally. had defined characters. We had guys that cut great promos, great vignettes. We had consistent storytelling. You could mm -hmm. not find plot holes and loopholes in our show from week to week to week. I mean, that was really, you know, Rob, look, I, look you, you mentioned it before, but I, I'm going to say it. Taking everything else aside, Rob does not get nearly the credit that he deserves for what he contributed on the on the creative level to XPW. Um, I agree. A lot of what it was at the time was, you know, Rob was heavily focused on the main event. Like that was his baby. He whatever the right, main event yeah. feud was, mm -hmm. he he would he would book that. Um, and then the kind of the undercard fell to me in part because right, he didn't yeah. care as much and in part because mm -hmm. that was that was what I was good at was was writing mm -hmm. the, the the rest of the stories filling in the plot holes um and making sure that we had consistent storytelling uh yeah. and you know a lot of times that means booking backwards you know where are we trying to get right, to right. what are we going to do to get mm -hmm. there and i think you know that's one of the biggest things that's lost i think today in pro wrestling um in totally. general you know you you don't have that backwards booking i mean even when we did wrestling society x it was the same thing i sat down I wrote the tenth and final episode, and then right. I worked backwards. How are we gonna? Well, I wrote at the time what I wanted the pay per view to be, but and then we booked right, backwards. Right. And and I think that you know, so but if you go and watch XPW TV, there there was good matches, good storytelling. I say this all the time, you know, I, rather than the legacy of XPW be the West Coast knockoff version of ECW. I hope that when people really look back and analyze it and actually go and watch it, XPW is kind of remembered as the B movie version of pro wrestling, sexier, bloodier, uh, 
low production value, but embracing it, right? It was right, tongue in cheek right. for us. You know, we we had a six month stretch where we couldn't do any live events. We had no live events booked. So the show basically became a sketch comedy improv vignette show. Yeah. Uh, and those are some of the best episodes. Some of the yeah, most memorable right. that people still talk about the 7-Eleven bit and the doghouse yeah. bit and this bit and that bit. And so I think that if you just, you know, if you gave it to a fan today with no preconceived notion and you ask them to sit down and watch 130 episodes of XBW TV, they're going to walk away going, this, this was actually pretty good. And especially, you know, in the second half of our existence, where we had really good wrestlers and really good wrestling matches. And a lot of people just never got over. I, you know, I've always described it this way, right? People hated XPW when they felt like it was the West coast ripoff of ECW. And right. then when their beloved ECW died, rather than say, let me check out XPW. Cause maybe it's going to fill some of that void. They were like, screw you. My beloved ECW mm -hmm. is dead and I'm never yeah. going to support this, you know, bullshit or whatever. Um, and I think a lot of people, a lot of people missed out on it. And I think that if people go yeah. back now, I mean, that's why, like you mentioned, you know, there's been this kind of, um, you know, uh, revived interest in it. Uh, and I think that you have these people now coming out with these fond memories of it and going back and watching some of what we did and going, you know what, that, yeah. that wasn't really as bad as, as I remember it hearing it was, yeah. you know, so Totally. We'll see. We'll see what the what it, the future it, holds. For the the I, true legacy. I, I kind of made an analogy the other day. We were talking about music, and and I love my my favorite band of, of all time is the Scorpions, and and so for example, here's a band that was like in the er, in seventies and early eighties. They were hardcore metal band, like they were right right there with ACDC and all those bands. But as time went on, they evolved and turned some fans off. Personally, I like that because. If I go through their catalog, I have so many different eras to choose from. It's not like I love ACDC, but they sound the same all the time. Their, their songs and their albums. But at the time in the 90s and all that, when people were getting turned off from Scorpions, they got turned off not because of the music that was they were playing, but because what they were supposed Blood to be. Rock. As you just teleported into another dimension. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were talking about fans not appreciating something for what it is versus um, having the perception of comparing it to something else that they already know. And which was XPW to ECW and not looking at XPW for its own entity. And I was kind of comparing it. I had a conversation about music with somebody that uh, a friend of mine that works at KLOX uh, radio station out here in LA. And he, he and I were talking about a band. We both like my favorite band, the Scorpions. And that if you know rock music <clears throat> scorpions back in the 70s early to mid 80s they were right there with iron maiden and acdc and all these bands and then in the 90s they took a different approach they they focused a little bit more on their ballads and almost sounded a little bit like queen in some of their ballads but a lot of fans got turned off by this not because of the quality of the music they were putting out but because they weren't ACDC enough anymore. They weren't Iron Maiden enough anymore. But now when people look back in uh, retrospect and look at this music that they, the Scorpions put out from the 90s all the way up, uh, people are appreciating that music. Wow, wow, these are good albums. This is good music. But at the time, they didn't want to hear it. And if they, and if they didn't have the moniker Scorpions and that history of starting as a hard, hard, heavy band, then people would have appreciated that music. And, and they are doing that now in large part. You hear people talking in the music scene, right? So I think, I think uh, that was my analogy with XPW to where, okay, if I can just look at this league for what it is versus compare it or what it's supposed to be, um, I'm not going to enjoy it as much. And like, and like the fans of music that look back at that 90s Scorpions that was lighter, oh, that's good music. It's like you said, people look back now at XPW. It's like, oh, that was, for what it was, that was a good quality show. It was funny. It was interesting. And the writing was consistent. Uh, one thing I could say about yourself and Rob, when we did XPW TV, we would air on Saturdays and we'd usually come into the office Tuesdays, <laughs> usually Wednesday nights to tape the wraparounds to call the matches. And I just remember that 
you know, going into the office and us all brainstorming, you and Rob were like, I mean, you guys, it was like a science class. It was like, uh, it was so much thought that was put into it on the blackboard, on paper. In the books, Kevin, I've told people about you uh, in the WSX days. You had this like this time life, not a huge book about race relations in the world and in America. And you studied that. And I, and I always admired that, that you put that much time and thought into things like that. So XPW definitely every single match and every single storyline and program that either wrestler was working on all of it had great thought into it and that and then when we got our scripts when we got our wraparounds it was like oh boy kevin wrote me another novel right now <laughs> you know I gotta, I, but, but that was but i look back on that and i and i look back at all those wraparounds it was like man that was so intricate and it was so good and it was so it was so meaningful. There was so much psychology that went into that, that even we maybe didn't appreciate at the time because we were just doing our job, working and enjoying being on a wrestling show, living out our dreams. Um, we, I did definitely understand what, what, what it was all about, but I think there's a different uh, appreciation even for me looking back on all that stuff now. Yeah, I think, well, so first off, like, I, I, just to recap you know, what I had said before, I do think that at the beginning, yeah, I don't, I don't want to dismiss the fact that at the beginning, the whole goal was West Coast ECW. Um, but like yeah. I said, it, it evolved. And I think, you know, right, if you want right. to say we didn't get credit for something as a, as a group, it was we never got credit that we evolved. Um, right. And, you know, yeah, I mean, look, I, I would every time I go into bookstores, uh, you know, I liked being able to plant seeds and tidbits and different things of reality into what people said and what they did. And, you know, we had a handful of wrestlers who could cut their own promos off the top of their head. You know, Webb never needed anyone's script for him. Uh, uh, Damon Steele never needed anyone to give him a script. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of guys, they needed, whether it was bullet points or whether they needed full scripts written for them, and, that, and that's what we did. But, you know, I think a lot, when, when people look at WWE today and they complain that guys, uh, the promos aren't the way they used to. Because back in the day, you gave someone bullet points, and now you do a full script for them. I don't think necessarily that giving somebody a full script is the problem. If you understand that character, understand how the audience is going to perceive the character, and can speak in the actual tone that that wrestler should be right. having, that that character should be having. You know, mm -hmm. when I was writing for... Yeah, I think he always got a kick out of it. Uh, uh, Bobby uh, Darlin, uh, Lewis Cipher in in yeah. uh, in XPW. I mean, Lewis Cipher essentially had a white supremacist gimmick. I mean, that was that was who it was. He always thought it was so funny that here's this Jewish kid writing these <laughs> outlandish, you know, promos for him. But I was writing using, you know. Uh, history books and using right. the, you know real right. quotes and real uh, philosophies and exactly. you know still, like for me one of <laughs> like the whole homeless Jimmy story um, is still one of my most favorite things with with XPW because I literally took uh, a philosophical uh, a philosophical uh, treaty I guess you would call it um, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs which says mm -hmm. that basically if you don't have food and shelter and you don't have this and you don't have that, then you can never have love and you can never get to like self-actualization because you need the basics to survive. So I took that philosophy and I took uh, Kevin Smith's um, uh, Chasing Amy and I smashed There's those two things Jimmy, together. By the way. And uh, you know, Jimmy. we came up with the homeless Jimmy story. And I, and I just think that, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot. Of, and again, to me, it wasn't, it was, it was that we had these clearly defined characters oh, that yeah. had their unique voices. Um, and I think even to get even, into even though Jimmy didn't have a voice, he had a unique voice. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, like to get into that though, like I really had to, I had to try to speak as that character. Like I'd be driving in my car, right, speaking out loud promos as these guys, as I was trying to like figure out what to write for them. I remember clear as day one time driving down the 405 freeway. 
And this girl in this car next to me is like looking at me and just like laughing at me. Cause this is before everyone had cell phones and you could, you know, get away with like, you were talking on your cell phone in your car. And she's just like, why is this guy talking to himself? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm sitting there, you know, I'm trying to get a, you know, a, a, a promo down in my head for somebody. And right, voice right. And talking out loud. And anyway. No, I, I remember, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't involved with the writing as you were, but I remember same scenarios of like, if we would, if we would watch, let's say we were doing a, a, an event at Reseda Country Clubs, LA Sports Arena, which we'll get into in a little bit, Grand Olympic Auditorium. And I remember on, on the way home or during, I was going to college at the time myself. And, and I remember thinking like, okay, these two guys fought, this is where the storyline's going. How am I going to put across what this guy was going through in the ring? And, and I was trying to just put myself in, into their shoes. Like, how would I feel going through what I went through in that match? And then trying to convey that uh, within the announcing, you know, and trying my hardest to not just call the moves, which, which I, which you talk about the evolution of XPW. <laughs> I can't stand watching old original XPW matches and listening <laughs> to myself. I hate it, you know, but so I definitely, I mean, I, whatever you, however you want to view me as an announcer, I, I, at the very least, I know that I've evolved from, let's say 99 to 03. My God, don't pop any and listen to me at 99 footage of me. <laughs> but, but, but I, I, I was understanding, uh, I think all of us had a, a pretty good understanding of the business before we got into it, but then a, a huge education being on the other side of that curtain, which was my dream, uh, it kind of coincides with you. I remember you said you went to WrestleMania or you watched WrestleMania 7, and that's kind of where you found out. And I remember going to a house show with my family uh, prior to that in the late 80s or something, maybe 90, but uh, no, late 80s. And 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 uh, driving home with my family, my mom was like, hey, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, why? And She's like, well, you weren't really watching the matches. And I was like, what do you mean? And, and I, you were just watching the people around you. And I remember that's when I was captivated by the fact that here we go to the sports arena for Laker or Clipper games, same amount of people, but everybody is acting the same way for this wrestling as they would a Laker game. And I just remember in that moment, I wanted, I want to be behind that curtain. I want to know how this works. I want to be a part of this. And I, so I understood enough as a fan, but again, going backstage and behind the curtain, it was for one, like a privilege to all of us to be back there on that side of the curtain. And what a learning experience. I mean, what it was, it was, that was my real college, right? Going, being, being back there and all that. And and I think we could get into this later, but that's where like when people say it's arguable that kayfabe is dying. When we started with XPW, it was still very much alive at that point. It was kind of toward the end, but it was pre super internet to where yep. like it was still felt like the wild west in a way being backstage at an XPW event versus let's fast forward six, seven years later when we did WSX and the whole indie scene at that time, so much had changed in since let's say the late nineties to like even the early mid two thousands to where it was almost a safe haven. Now everybody knew what was going on. But when we were back in the day with early, at least early XPW, almost all of XPW, but specifically early XPW, there was still that old school vibe. There was that old school feel. There was that uh, you are privileged to be back here in this locker room. And it's not, and, and, there, and there was, they, we still had that code back then of this is what we talk about back here. You do not talk about this with anybody else. And, and from when we started till now, I mean, I could tell you personally, like, gosh, have I seen that change so much? And it's oh, a little yeah. bit bitter. It's a little bit bittersweet because we can do interviews like this now and we can listen to interviews that talk about this. But ironically, as we are talking about this, I, I understand that this is, I guess, chipping away at what part of what why we wanted to get into the business in the first place was to be on the other side of that curtain and to be in that hidden society, if you will. But but at the same time, uh, wrestling still works and it's and it's surviving just fine. So uh, but nonetheless, Kevin. Um, so we are now in, in the early stages of XPW. We're just now getting on TV. So we were doing shows in Ventura, 
and, and in uh, Reseda and some in Bakersfield. And this is kind of keeping us near our home base in Van Nuys, so to speak, is I'm, I'm guessing why we really went to these venues and to spread out our name, San Bernardino. We went a couple of times, but uh, no. I think the big, I'm, I'm sorry. San Bernardino, San Bernardino was not good. To us. <laughs> no, I was, I think we went once or twice. That was about yeah. it. But, uh, but, any, but anyway, um, so, so let's fast forward now a little bit to where I think that we really made a big impact. And for people that watch wrestling today, I don't know how much of an impact you realize back in the day when we got a star from another company. Back in those days, that put you on the map. It wasn't like today where people are contracted out, they can do a match here and there. If you got a star and you were now on television. So let's fast forward to when we got to the Palace in Hollywood, which is which is right there on the corner of Hollywood and Vine if you're not from Southern California. It's a historic landmark. It's called Avalon now or maybe it's something different now, but it was yeah. the palace in Hollywood. It was a palace in Hollywood. And, and that was the event where Shane Douglas appeared and the lights went out and Shane Douglas was out there. And again, for people that don't realize how much of an impact that was for a wrestling league to pull something like that off back in the day was like, Oh man, uh, eyes were, uh, uh, pe we got people's attention. Now we got people's attention and we were starting to be taken seriously now because we're on television, because we're starting to get these stars and because we, we had money behind us. That was huge. Yeah. Uh, well, and it, I mean, that was definitely uh, the first, I think, you know, pivotal moment for the company. Um, Rob was so proud of that. I mean, we watched yeah. that Shane promo over yeah. and over and over. Uh, in the totally. office, like, like tears welling up in his eyes that, you know, we right. finally got to that point where somebody was, you know, and at that first, I mean, look, Shane Douglas, for anything else you want to say about Shane Douglas, that dude has always been one of the best talkers. Um, oh, yeah. And, you know, he did this amazing promo about how just like he put ECW on his back, he's going to put XPW on his back and build this company. And it was, I mean, it, 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 certainly in the history of XPW, it was top uh, you know one of the top few if not the top promo uh in terms of both delivery and what it meant an impact um yeah. mm -hmm. and uh yeah it, we had shane now and we had chris candido now and we had sabu now and it was just you know we, it was what we didn't have said with that exact moment but um it was it was growing and it was growing uh to a point where people were starting to take notice and like you said i mean the two things that that really separated us from the pack, um, because maybe people had a better in ring product, you know, bell to bell when a mat, you know, the bell rang. Maybe at, especially at that point, people maybe had a better in ring product, the Ring of Honors of the world or whatever. Um, but we had television, not just in L A, but syndicated on America One throughout the country, right. mm -hmm. and we had home entertainment videos right. uh, at first videos in stores before ECW ever did. And so and we, al we had, also, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we were the first to put out a DVD even before yeah. WWF. Is that correct? Uh, not, uh, not before WWF, definitely before, uh, I don't WCW? think before WWF, maybe possibly, I, but I definitely could, before, could, before I, ECW. I could swear that we were, because of course we had the backing of that industry that was funding yeah. us and they already had, they already had the tools. They had the editing technology rooms. Was there. They had, yep. The technology was there and DVDs were relatively new at that time. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm sure people will correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, we were the first wrestling company in America, I think, to put out a DVD. I, I, we, I were, I might be, we, were definitely we were definitely early. early. And I remember on Entertainment Tonight, at one point, I forget which which it was, but we were the number four sports DVD in the country, and it oh, yeah. ran for like a week or so. We we were constantly hitting that Billboard top ten sports chart, um, yeah. and it was and that's the thing. So you have this independent group, right? And they're only we were only drawing, you know, a uh, thousand people, fifteen hundred people, whatever it was live, um, which is still, I mean, you know, most indies today don't draw that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. but we had this syndicated television and we had these DVDs. And if you were a kid in the middle of Iowa or in the middle of, you know, I don't know, uh, Kansas or Arkansas or somewhere where you didn't have a big indie wrestling scene 
and you didn't have not WWE wrestling, you were gravitating towards XPW. Um, and yeah. it was, I mean, that's where a lot of our fan base came from was throughout the country. I mean, even to this day, I think XPW's reputation, certainly in Mexico and possibly in Japan, much bigger and more respected than it ever was in the United States. Um, right. You know, I, I, I was telling the story again recently when, when Lester, unfortunately, uh, passed away. Supreme. Supreme. But Supreme. When we went down years after XPW to the, um, uh, it's called Lucha Li- yeah, it was called Lu- no, no, uh, it was called Lucha Libre La Experiencia. It's what inspired my current company, Master Public's uh, Expo Lucha. It is big two day event, three day event in Mexico City, and every wrestling group, AAA, CMLL, every wrestling group. I mean, it was nothing like that would have ever happened here in the U.S. You couldn't, you could never imagine an, an event where WWE and WCW had shows at the same, you know, place in the, and the same and the, two close, the, the closest we ever came to that was back in the mid nineties at the world wrestling peace festival yep. at the yep. LA sports arena where WWF actually at the time pulled out, but WCW was there, all, yep. uh, Japan, Mexico. And, and so that was the only and closest event we ever had. Right. Yeah. And so, so these, <laughs> every, every company would put on, would put on a, a, a show and, and, uh, Pedro's del mall, uh, the, the promotion that the late, Hijo de Pedro Guayo ran, they love bringing in Supreme. Um, and so, and Damien, uh, say, 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 from, uh, XPW was uh, the booker there, uh, for a lot of their run. And I remember going to the expo with Lester and, he was treated like a freaking rock star by the Mexican right. fans. Like not, not just a wrestling star. He was treated yeah. like this American TV, uh, you know, uh, rock star. And it was, it was amazing. And it was like understanding in that moment, the respect that XPW had outside of America. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was so it, much it, bigger than it ever had in America. You know, and the fact that a oh, homeless Jimmy and Supreme went to Japan and became tag team champions in Japan. And there's still people in Japan who, you know, reference XPW, know XPW. Uh, and it's 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 pretty uh, amazing. But that was all because of the TV and the DVDs. And it really it really was a game changer. And, and the thing is, too, that's the only the DVD, the home entertainment line was the only thing keeping XPW going financially. Right. Uh, I mean, that was where we made our money. We never made money on live events. We never really made much money on merchandising, but we were making hundreds of thousands of dollars in the in the later part of XPW on those home video sales. You know, it's I don't know if I've ever told you the story, but like maybe back in the day when XPW was going on, like once or twice, uh, someone would recognize me if they were a fan. And and Wrestling Society X, uh, it was rare, right? It was rare, and it could have been any one of us on that show. I don't know if I told you this, but back in 2007, I went to Europe in 2015 and in, in 2000, 2007, summer of seven, and I was rented a motorcycle and I was driving around Rome and I went to the Coliseum, asked someone to take a picture of me and I never get this in the US. And I asked the guy to take a picture like, oh, Chris, you're Chris Kloss. I was blown the frick away, dude. <laughs> <laughs> like blown away. I don't, I, and he barely spoke English. I don't know if it was from WSX or XPW, but I remember when I got to Rome, wrestling was all over television there. It was all uh, Italy. It was like booming. So I remember yeah, Italy had a hotel. really strong scene. And, and I remember going to my hotel room, like in this foreign country, I'm like finally away from home. And I turned TV on in the hotel room. I was like, Oh, these are guys I work with. Like, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so, so it was like, all right, wow, this is unbelievable. And sure enough, that, that ended up happening in, in Rome of all places. And, and like I said, if it, it is not about me. It could have been any one of us from, from the show. But, but uh, I remember that feeling that big time. And I remember Australian fans too. Like we were known there as well more than we were in the US. So go figure, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's like, with a, again, going back to music, there's a lot of musical acts that are like that, that internet it, like the scorpions for example like they were big here in the 80s but to this day they are like internationally they are right up there with in some countries right up there with led zeppelin with queen with all those bands like so it's it just different countries look at look at things differently um yeah no supreme, supreme i want to talk about that a little too because you kevin myself there's only a handful of us that were that were in spw from day one until the day it ended, which was again the two of us. I want to say Patrick Hernandez, 
almost right or was he yeah i was think so he? i think so yeah i think so and now now chaos almost made it right or was uh, he there at the end uh oh yeah i think i think like at I the very end before the end yeah i think i think he 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 ended the streak right there but i but other yeah. than that and then it was um you myself patrick and really supreme was pretty much it for for anyone that went from day one. And oh man, if I'm Webb. missing a name, I Webb. and what? No, no, no. He left before the end. Webb, Webb left before the end, and, and I and oh, I'll give right. Webb. Yeah. Some, I know. He, and of I'll, course, and I'll, I'll, I ended up ended I ended up editing the TV show. <laughs> well, <laughs> so. I, I didn't. I, I I wasn't. I I was I was starting to say this before you said that. I was going to say I will give Webb credit. He did a great job with the TV show, and it kind of went to okay, shit after. Great. <laughs> well, well yeah. no, look, listen, listen. Uh, we, you know, no, but but anyway, but anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, real quick. Uh, we were we were the, we were like, there's only four of us, right? And then, and Lester was one of those guys. He was the guy. And and talk about when you brought up Shane Douglas earlier on, and I remember those nights at the office when we turned all the lights out and we kept watching that promo over and over from the palace. <laughs> but I also remember. I don't know if you remember this too, Kevin, but I remember in the office there were like eh, sidewise a little bit because a little bit of the local guys were like, eh, what is this shit? Like we 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 can carry this. And there was this this feeling of like, hey, we're we're the homegrown guys, and what is this like uh entities coming from the outside in order for us to build this company? I mean, from a business standpoint, I totally understand why we did it, but I can also understand the gripe of some of these local guys that put their heart their blood, sweat, and tears, even before XBW in the indie days to make this thing happen. So Lester was one of those guys, though, that gained that legendary status and was a homegrown guy. He was, by XPW's mm -hmm. end, he was right up there with any of the guys that came from WCW, oh, yeah. WWF, ECW. And, and that says a lot for Supreme because he was – his own he was not a ripoff of anything he created that was him in large part yep. that was him i mean even in the office like it was rare once in a while i got to talk to lester but usually it's supreme we were talking to <laughs> you know and yep. um i shared a story uh you know lester was synonymous for making us pay our dues especially us announcers us reps and us new wrestlers that came in and and those those angles on XPW TV wasn't far from the truth or he was going in to find Rob and he was shoot punching these kids. That's who Lester was. He was getting across in the storyline of what he, what he believed in. Right. Um, and again, this is part of that wild West mentality that we were still involved with within pro wrestling that you're just not going to see anymore backstage. Right. Mm. So, but, but Lester himself was, was um, his own made individual and He's sorely missed, and I think I think he needs a lot of credit for the success of not just his own character, but of XPW. Because again, he kept the fans on board that didn't necessarily want to see outsiders, the local LA fans, and he also had the respect of the mainstream or the East Coast fans as well. He was one of those guys that crossed over, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. I mean. First off, on the you know on the deathmatch hardcore side of XPW, yeah, there was there was nobody bigger. Uh, I mean, we could bring in anyone from ECW, and the fans were going to side with Supreme. He was their hometown hero, uh, homegrown hero, you know, uh, which is great, uh, absolutely great. And you know, again, yeah, when you look at his popularity in Japan, his popularity in Mexico, uh, yeah. you know, legendary status, uh, at least definitely in Mexico, went on to hold a number of titles there. You know, and people could talk all they want about, you know, well, it's pro wrestling. What is what does the championship mean? It's all fake. But it's like getting a championship belt put on you means that the owner of the promotion, the booker of the promotion has faith and trust in you and feels you are mm -hmm. of a certain caliber. You know, we don't give, you know, we're not the military. We don't give medals of honor or badges of honor. We're not, uh, you know, a, a regular corporate environment where you can climb the ladder from manager to director to vice president, you know. This is pro wrestling, and those championship runs are are the the honors that are bestowed upon you. And I think right. that um, you know his his legacy as the only four time 
uh, I think it was, you know, King of the Death match uh, in XPW, his legacy, you know, winning multiple titles all over the world. It says a lot about, you know, him being, I would argue, I don't think anyone could argue that he is the biggest West Coast deathmatch wrestler in history. And I don't know that we're ever going to see anyone suppress him. And any any rivals, not just the West Coast, but he's definitely in the topic of conversation of all time, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. country or world. Um, I don't know if you want to share a, a story, but I was just on the Vegas Bad Boys uh, podcast that they interviewed me not too long ago. And they asked me to tell uh, like a rib story of Supreme. And and all I could, I, I couldn't really think of any ribs, but I mean, there were, but I guess I was lucky enough not to get any, <laughs> uh, any of them too bad directed toward me. But I do remember that, um, you know, he demanded kind of like you hear the stories of Andre the Giant, like he, he demanded respect in that XPW locker room. Like he kind of was the, the undertaker of our locker room mm-hmm. in many ways. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember he and I happened to be sitting next to each other on a plane ride home from Philly. And I was on the aisle and he was on the middle and the window. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but I remember that plane ride home, I got to know Lester and Lester got to know not Chris Kloss, the announcer, but that is my real name, by the way, folks, Chris Kloss, the Chris Kloss, the, the person. And a lot, I could say like, a lot was different between us after that. And it was really, it was, it was, it was, it was awesome. And getting to know him uh, behind the facade of Supreme, again, there's a lot of similarities, but getting to know Lester, like he was, he was a solid, solid dude. And he was a stand up, stand up guy. He was, he wouldn't, he wouldn't necessarily treat you wrong unless you were, Asking for it, I, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Okay, one rib, one rib. I'll tell you, uh, it was kind of funny. Which was, uh, you remember former ring announcer Guido, of course. Yeah. And Guido was very, very full of himself, and and like as the ring announcer, this guy was like full of himself, right? And and he didn't quite know how wrestling worked, and he would push buttons, he would rub people the wrong way, and and all this and that. And remember, I was I was kind of carpooling with him because he lived near me and and he was like 15 years older than me, right? Something like that. And the he did not know how to act. And and I remember we were at the LA Sports Arena, and after we were done doing the announcing uh for the internet at the time, we I come into the back and Guido's got his his he's soaking wet, sitting on the floor in handcuffs. <laughs> and 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 the guys are coming by pouring pouring shit all over him and i'm like dude this guy's got to go in my car i got to give him a ride home don't pour beer all over him i'm like guido what happened and all and all guido <laughs> said to me he looked up on the floor he said yeah supreme told me to sit here for a while and don't say nothing <laughs> that was, so i don't know what happened all i know is guido like he full of himself and i i'm sure those guys were oh, in his man. place and that was just like yeah, so that was like, yeah, that was Lester's doing. And that was like, yeah, he probably had a comment anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, yeah, yeah so I, I don't know about you, but it was, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty sad, you know. I mean, I know he had some pre-existing health problems for the last few years, but it still, yeah. it still came out of the blue. And, I mean, you and I both, not just us and the people we've been involved with, but throughout professional wrestling, as people know, a lot of untimely deaths and – We've been through a lot of them, you know. We we I just want to experience. Mm-hmm. I just want to plug real quick. Um, in the in the aftermath of Lester's passing, um, we we did a few different fundraising efforts uh, to try to put some money together for his uh, wife Karen and son Kano, and two of those things are still available right now. So, if you're listening and you want to uh, support Lester's family or thank him for uh, all he did uh, for your entertainment and his career. Over at lapelyad.com, L-A-P-E-L-Y-E-A, lapelyad.com, uh, we have a King of the Death Match pin. It's a, it's a lapel pin of the King of the Death Match title. Um, Rob yeah. gave his blessing that uh, you know all the cool. profits from the use of that pin go to a uh, family. You. So we work with. Thank you, um, Thank you Rob. Yeah, uh, we worked with uh, Lapelyad. It's a, it's a pin gorgeous. It's amazing. Um, so check that out. 
And then also um, over at lucha-masks.com, uh, there is a supreme uh, PPE style mask for you. You're, you know, you're going to need it for a few mm -hmm. more months now. So uh, right. you can go and pick that up as well. Lucha-masks with an S.com. And 100% uh, of the profits from both those are uh, going to uh, Karen uh, and Kano. So awesome, man. Awesome. And all, all our best to Karen and Kano and the rest of Lester's family in these difficult times. Um, and, and well, when, when Supreme was on top, that was like during, well, I guess he was always on top in XBW uh, here and there, except for the time when he was Lester and he had to find himself. And those are some great angles, by the way. Yes. But, um, but when he was announced at the pa palace in Hollywood, that was kind of cool. Cause he was from Hollywood and all that. And, and then transitioning, Kevin, one of my, when I, when people ask me about my, my favorite memories of XPW, there, there are so many, but I still hold near and dear to my heart the day that we went to the LA sports arena. I mean, that to me is like, it was, it yep. was like a dream come true. That's where all of us who grew up in LA went to go see WWF. Uh, I was, I was at WrestleMania seven. I should have gone to WrestleMania two. It was a school night. Damn it. But, uh, <laughs> But um, I was at WrestleMania 7, all the house shows and everything, and the Los Angeles Sports Arena. I mean, that was like before all you youngsters, uh, before Staples Center was there, it was the Sports Arena and the Forum. Those were the two places. And even before the Forum, the Sports Arena is the original uh, pro basketball arena. And, 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 uh, for the and I think as a wrestling fan, I mean, as a West Coaster, you know, this, this was our Madison Square Garden. This is, yes. like you said, this yeah. is where when I um, when I first started going to WWF shows, they were all at the LA Sports Arena. So to be mm -hmm. able to bring an XPW show there, uh, it really it really was uh, an amazing moment in you know, my personal career um, to be able to, to do that. And, you know, it was our one year anniversary. It was... Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had Terry Funk and Sabu headlining. We had, uh, I think at the time, you know, I haven't gone back and watched it, but, you know, you, you talked about the difference between, um, you know, our wrestling and other wrestling. And, you know, by the time that we came around to that year, CZW was in existence. There was other wrestling companies in existence doing death matches. But and what, and what show was that? That was, that was the Go Funk Yourself. Yeah, yeah Go Funk Yourself. Yeah. And so you had, you had an incredible main event of Funk and Sabu. That was the day that Rob Black became a character on air, which was never right. a plan originally. Um, that was something that kind of he got forced into by Shane and Lazy. Uh, but it worked out phenomenally, obviously, because him as a character carried that TV show for the next first number of years. First he, didn't, first, he didn't want to go on TV. Then he didn't want no. to go off TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but one of the other, you know, classic matches on that show was Supreme versus Messiah, which was, you know, one of the best x rivalries of all time in a death match. And I mean, I always kind of use that as an example of what made our match, our death matches at the time different than other death matches that were going on. It's that for our death matches, they weren't walk around the ring and hit people with this weapon and hit people with that weapon. Our death matches were straight up wrestling matches with good psychology, but the bumps just happened to be into effed up shit. Uh, you were bumping yeah. into thumbtacks, you were bumping into you know, light tubes, you were bumping into, but the matches still had psychology. They still were storytelling. It wasn't mm -hmm. just violence for the sake of violence. And you know that's not to say that we never had you know a violent crap, as Larry Rivera would call them, you know, death match, <laughs> but. The, you know, time of that LA Sports Arena and the Go Funk Yourself show. Uh, I mean, that was a hell of a show. Yeah, it was. And what were some of the hurdles? Do you remember? I remember going. It was myself, you, Rob, and Webb. And Rob, it was in Rob's car, and the four of us actually went to the sports arena the first time we checked it out. And I don't know if you remember that day or not, but um, no, but I don't remember. No, that. you don't. Yeah, I remember. I remember the whole way there. Uh, Rob wanted me to to do the Vince McMahon WrestleMania Seven promo over and over <laughs> and over and over again for the LA Coliseum. But I was happy to do it, and it was just a great time, man. But I remember we went in there, and and we we got a tour. We were we were looking at. I can't believe you don't remember this, man. It was it was um, 
it was the four of us. It was you, me, Rob, and Webb. And we went down to the sports arena just to, to do a walkthrough. And we were talking to the guys. By the way, folks, uh, just just this is the wrestling chatter. And I do have to tell you this. When we talked to the CEO or of the Coliseum and Sports Arena Commission at the time, and he was there in 1991, and I asked him point blank, did WrestleMania Seven move from the Coliseum to the Sports Arena because of the Iraq War? And he said, no, they couldn't sell tickets. And he said that point blank to me. <laughs> I so remember I that. Heard that. Yeah, <laughs> I heard that from the guy. And I was like, I knew it. I knew it, damn it. I knew it. But, uh, but, I, but, but nonetheless, I remember going there and, and it was like, okay, this is where, this is the bigs now. I mean, we're already on TV. We're doing what we need to do. But now we really need to pull our bootstraps up. And, and if we're going to continue this and continue this in a venue like this, I think it stepped our game up a little bit. At least for me, it did. Um, I think that's when I started noticing, let's say, my evolution as far as announcing goes and caring about the stories I'm telling and whatnot. And and uh, just taking pride in the fact that we're performing and I'm calling a match from the sports arena and, and we are there. And I think I could speak for everybody, the boys at least for sure, like walking out there. Even when I was going into the ring introducing the show, I'm just like looking up at the stands like, wow, that, that's where I was sitting for WrestleMania. And now I'm in the ring, you know, and so I think a lot of us have those same feelings. And to me, I think that's when when we we it was another transition period in the league. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have I have a few distinct memories of, of running in that building. Um, one of them was, like you said, uh, you know, being there before the show started. Like, I remember exactly what part of the ring I was standing at. And just looking around and going like, this is real and this is big. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just being so, you know, honored really to to have been able to do that. Um, you know, and, and we knew going in, the, we weren't there to fill the building. We weren't going to put 18,000 or 10,000 or whatever it holds in there. Um, there was never an expectation. We never, you know, the upper balconies weren't ever sold or opened. You know, we, we were there to try to put a few thousand people in there. We did. Uh, we had about yeah. 2,000, I think, people in there. Uh, maybe it was uh, up to close to 2,500. It, I think it, it was kind of like if it kind of like how uh, fans, if if you watch the recent uh, XFL 2.0, uh, how like in Seattle or St. Louis they would sell the lower bowl, right? Exactly, and, and it would feel and it would still feel like almost an NFL yeah. caliber type game, and that's basically what we did. We sold that lower right. bowl, and you could feel the feel like you know just as much. If you as look at the tape. Yeah, if you look at the tape, it looks packed. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, because it was that lower level was was mm -hmm. was packed. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we we went in there because we had a ridiculously sweet deal. I think it cost us less to get in there than did the palace in Hollywood or whatever. And uh, I remember it. Correct me if I'm not wrong, but it was such a sweet deal because I th I want to say it was somewhere around two grand we paid mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it was yeah. somewhere around like two thousand dollars. It, it was, was like crazy. Are we, crazy, right? It was like you can't even rent a one bedroom apartment for two grand. You know, <laughs> we had the, the LA Sports Arena. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. I, we kept that under wraps though. Nobody really kind of that was just knowledge that we only yeah, knew I mean, at the it time. Was, so. it, it was part of this really bizarre thing that happened which which really became storyline uh on television for rob becoming the character but as a long mm -hmm. story short mm -hmm. there was a guy that had said he wanted to uh invest in xpw they wanted to help build build the company um they he was the connection to the la sports arena so that's why we mm -hmm. how we got in there um but in the end when we analyzed the deal it wasn't an investment i mean it was an investment but it basically said that if it was a loan and if we ever defaulted even one dollar by one day, he was going to own the whole company. Like it sounds like it's straight out of a movie, like the Muppet movie, or something, right? <laughs> There's this evil, you know, person with money, and he's going to. Uh, but that was the deal, and so in the end, we wow. never signed the deal, and we never got that influx of cash, and we stopped running shows at the Elliott Gordon Arena after you know a couple. Of shows. I think we only did two shows there. Um, two or th but, three, maybe. I think we yeah, did three. No, it might have been three. Uh, it was, it was okay. two or three. Um, and uh, but yeah, no, I mean that first one. And when you mentioned the challenges, to me, the biggest challenge that I remember is so normally I kind of so so Rob ran the gorilla position and I would run music 
uh, because of all the cues um, and even like uh, just in the last maybe five years of doing shows have I stopped doing music cues um, even in Wrestling Society X as we were doing television I was given the cues um, because there's a lot of timing just of, of the right deal and flow um, so normally though that either happened kind of in the center of it all um, like at the palace or or um, at the at the receipt of country club but where there was easy walkie talkie distance um, where there was easy if I had to run backstage to handle something I could but at the LA sports arena it was literally up in the ceiling of the sports arena mm-hmm. it was yeah. a five to 10 minute journey back from the yeah. running music to the, uh, to the, to the locker room. Other thing right. for those listening now who uh, were not part of the scene back then, let me tell you something. Y'all are spoiled running music for shows off of a computer uh, because we had dual CD players that you had to queue <laughs> yeah. up to the right track. Wow, man. And yeah. that led to so many wrong songs being played or this or that or whatever, or this CD player is not or, playing. Or, or, scratch, or yeah, scratch, scratch CDs. And, oh my God. So y'all have it really good these days. Yes. No, no, no joke. But, but yeah, talking about the sports arena, that was something that I think uh, lifted us up, put us on the map even more. Uh, like Shane Douglas before at the palace and, and those, those, instances i think people this was another thing that people took notice of and um now where were you now this was we're talking 2000 now so where where were you what were you thinking in the year 2000 when you first heard the announcement that ecw's heat wave was going to be at the grand olympic auditorium in los angeles california ecw never going to the west coast prior to this well, so that was before Go Funk Yourself. And it was literally like weeks before Go Funk Yourself. Right. And so here we are getting ready to make our debut, our biggest show at the LA Sports Arena. And ECW is about to be in town a few weeks before, which is probably going to hurt our ticket sales. Um, right. uh, I mean, look, we made it out at the time to be this like, you know, crazy turf war thing. You guys are coming to our town, so we're going to stand up. Uh, look, it was a great business decision by ECW. They put, you know, They came out. They went to the the Olympic Auditorium. Um, they packed the place, and it was, uh, you know, it was it was a smart thing. And a long, long overdue. I mean, you know, ECW should have been out on the on the West Coast years and years before that. Um, right. You know, but the the story as it goes now with millions and millions of views on WWE.com with their their spin on the on the version of it. Um, when we heard this was happening, I, I turned to Rob and said, we should buy the front row. <laughs> we, should, we should buy the, the tickets and have our guys go in the front row. Um, and so that's what we did. I went and I stood in line at Ticketmaster in Tower Records on Sepulveda mm-hmm. Boulevard. No, not on Sepulveda, on, uh, uh, on, on Ventura Boulevard. Um, and uh, we the turn what? The front, uh, the, the one at Lorena Plaza in in uh, in Van Nuys at the Lorena Plaza. Oh, okay. and right. Now it's a big right. Oz store, or yeah. it was Oz, but yeah. But um, it was Tower Records. I didn't know that. And I forgot that, Kevin, that you did that. I, I thought there was some sort of hookup we got for those. Nope, seats. no, literally, I got wow. up at like 6 a.m. or whatever that day. This is back, you know, before Don't online figure, ticket mail. And you, you literally had to go stand in line at Ticket Outlet. And mm-hmm. there was a few people behind me in line. Um, but to be able to get that front row at the first moment. And then we also bought, like, part of the front row, the balcony section, yeah. uh, which is where yeah. I went. I went and sat. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, so that, that became uh, a legendary night where, you know, WWE spin is that we were there to, you know, jump the rail or that we were there to, you know, really do something bad. Uh, we were there to get publicity for our show that was coming up. We were there to, right. to get noted. Uh, the plan was that, uh, you know, we were going to have a row of, of people wearing XPW shirts and uh, then we were going to be, you know, flying outside. And, and there was never an intent to jump the rail. There was never an intent no. to interrupt the show. Um, no. It was all publicity stunt. And that's all publicity it was. stunt. That's all it was. Now, now, if you have some of the workers in XPW that did take exception to that, okay, that's one thing. They are they have the right to their own opinion. But uh, 
what, what, whether their opinion was, was um, taking exception to that or not, either way, our game plan was to just do a publicity stunt, even if some of the troops yeah. disagreed with it and were like, nope, this is our backyard. They can think that if they want to, but that was not our game plan. Now, I want to tell you a little story. You can see the image right there. I don't know if you can see it, Kevin. Yeah. But um, but that was the ringsiders when the when the locker room emptied out. Now I am look like I am see that shirtless dude with the blonde ponytail. <laughs> that is me. And people ask me all the time, "What in the world were you doing? Did you like take your shirt off, ready to fight?" No, I'm 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 not claiming it ever to be <laughs> Mr. Tough Guy at all. What happened there was we were sitting ringside, and when all hell broke loose and the locker room started coming out, uh, one of the Atlas security, I can't remember if it was Atlas or it might've been big set. No, it was Atlas security. One of them tried to pull me from the, um, from our seats into over the railing and onto the, onto the uh, ringside area. And as you know, in the wrestling business, once you cross that railing, you're fair yeah. game, you're trespassing. Yeah. So, so I knew this and I knew what he was trying to do. So I just kind of, let him like slip out of my shirt and let him like rip my shirt off basically that's why you see me like that but they were trying to get whoever they could over the railing to have open season so i didn't let that happen and then when all hell broke loose that's when the locker room came out security escorted us out and and again lester was uh, sitting there ready to fight the whole locker room man like he didn't want to back down or anything and but it, the publicity stunt turned into something a little bit more, and but that that wasn't that wasn't <laughs> us in, in, that wasn't us instigating it. We did our pl publicity thing, and then when all the hell broke loose, that was after our stunt was basically done with and over. So they took exception to us doing a stunt or assumed we were going to do a little bit more. And, well, and they, and then, I mean, they, they, I mean, literally, they came out, they filed out of the locker room in a line, rushing toward. I mean, that was a setup. You know what I mean? Right. Like that wasn't right. like, oh, there's something going on. Let's, you know, let's let's we're gonna send one guy, one guy runs out, and then people know. I mean, that was a straight up setup. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it, you know, uh, I've said it time and time again. You know, we we got labeled as these disrespectful. You know, uh, this should have never happened. It was disgusting. And I listen, I'm telling you, and I will stand by this to the end of time. If Paul Heyman had the idea to do that and had gone and bought the exactly. front row at Ticketmaster for a WWE event, it would have been called or the WCW. greatest event of all time. Yeah. Uh, you I know. know. And, yeah. and, but we were, we were, you know, we were the, 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 not rebels. We were the, you know, knockoff, uh, extreme, uh the ecw wannabes and so it, it never got the respect it deserved for being a freaking great idea for publicity stunt. i have noticed though kevin i don't know if you noticed too in recent years when this is brought up people have a uh i, I feel like people are starting to kind of glamorize xpw's involvement that day they're kind of like subtly switching to like oh, you know what that was actually kind of cool that you guys did that because now yeah, when you I, don't, I, never, I don't get that i don't you know I, I, okay cool. i've, 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 heard, I've yeah. heard that a few times <laughs> and and Good. and again this is maybe somebody without a preconceived uh notion or wasn't yep. already a fan back in the day that's finding it out for that the first sense. time because if you think about it at the time in that extreme era of wrestling Everybody was like, oh, I'm tired of the same old, same old. I want realism. I want this and that. And finally, something real happened. It's like, oh, that was messed yep. up. You guys shouldn't have yeah. done that. <laughs> right? you know? and, and it was like, it was like, what do you guys want? Like, this really happened. It wasn't like an invasion a la in your house from the ECW guys. That was a planned thing. I mean, they put that into a storyline and in your house because it's a cool idea. And we actually did this and executed it for real. So it was like kind of mind boggling, even at the time, like really like people aren't like in awe over this right now. Another thing too, is when we were talking about this and the Vegas bad boys were kind of asking me about this, asked me about the brawl in the parking lot. Cause we all got chased outside and it was bad. Right. And, and people went back inside to watch that match. And they were, they were basically saying like, gosh, you can watch the end of that pay-per-view on TV and it's going to be just like any other pay-per-view. 
how much valuable would it have been to stay outside and take some pictures of the real brawl that went down in the street versus to go back and watch the ending of just incredible Tommy Dreamer? You know, nothing to take away from those two guys, but anybody who was fighting in a match, right? So yeah. in a way, in a way, I, uh, I feel like people are starting, some people are starting to look back or maybe not even look back. Like you said, seeing, seeing it for the first time thing, wow, that really happened. Whoa, who are those guys, you know, and all this stuff. So, but anyway, yeah. um, what was, what was it for you? Like, um, as far as storyline goes, like for the aftermath of heat wave for, what did that mean for XPW at the time? Well, I mean, it, it, it just kind of solidified the war that had, you know, been in existence between Rob and Paul and XPW and ECW. And, you know, we still really Anytime anybody left ECW, we were the first phone call they made. People think people right. think that it was us recruiting. At first, of course, we were starting a wrestling league and we were mm -hmm. recruiting. But people would be calling us. I just left ECW. Can I get a booking? Or I'm mm -hmm. going to leave ECW. Will you guys book me if I leave ECW? And, mm -hmm. you know, we became the place. It was California. It was, you know, you, you got a trip to California. You got to hang out in L.A. You got to see Hollywood. You got to hang out, you know, uh, uh, in, a, in a cool city and, you know, work for a cool company to work for. Uh, people had fun coming out to work for us. Um, and so so it just kind of solidified that. And, you know, eventually, um, you know, Sabu came over and there was legal drama between uh, Sabu and ECW and then Rob you know, took up uh, Sabu's defense and was, you know, covering his legal fees and trying to help him get out of his, his contract. And um, it, it, it was a, both behind the scenes and in front of the camera. It was, you know, really, it, it sparked more of the battle than, um, you know, than anything. But yeah, it also opened a lot of people's eyes to, you know, unless you were kind of a hardcore fan following along, you didn't necessarily know um about everything that was going on but it it blew open the doors of you know xpw versus ecw right and then guys like sabu guys like um um new jack and and people that were like heavily involved in um ecw and took exception to xpw's involvement in heat wave I mean, that was kind of a ironic funny story it, when, when you talk about the history of xpw it's all the guys that ended up working it, for us. And it's the wrestling business. And the wrestling, wrestling business, business yes. is wrestling completely business. a what can you do for me today business. Exactly. I mean, that's what it is. Um, and, and there, there was are, a lot of... And, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it, it's not, it's, it's, by nature, it's not a business that you don't have a lot of like the ultimate loyalists, you know, who will never work for this company or never work for that company on principle. You know, I don't think that Tommy Dreamer maybe would have ever come to work for XPW. But beyond that, I don't think there's a single person that ever, I mean, Sandman came and worked for us. Just Incredible came and worked for us. Uh, you know, I mean, like that maybe, maybe Taz and, and Dreamer maybe would have been the only two that, that would have never come. But, um, you know, other than that, uh, it, it, and it, it's not just even about XPW. It's just you. You're in, call it what you want. You know, when you're not with a wrestling promotion, you are an independent contractor, and you're yeah. out there to go get your book. And you're out there, and it's that's just it. that's what it is. So, but it was very funny that you know all these people that talked mad shit on XPW the minute they could, they were asking for work. And that, and that maybe in a way we we inadvertently exposed the business a little bit there by just that happening you know fans realizing like oh these guys are now in xpw ah maybe that was all bullshit you know so i mean i know that happens from time to time throughout the wrestling world but the heat wave incident got a lot of eyeballs on the politics and it was it was like a fine line of real i mean that's what pro wrestling is right is where where is the where is the fine line from sport to entertainment and boy, if Heatwave was not an example of that, I don't know what is because now the fans are looking at this like, oh my gosh, this is very real. Uh, it, 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 to this day, I, I, I got to reiterate, like it does amaze me how 
that is kind of shit on that whole heat wave thing. It just doesn't add up to where, especially when you have fans that want realism. It it was the most rebellious thing that could have been done. I mean, with the exception of on that scale, on that scale, yes. Yeah, I mean, again, with, with the exception of jumping the railing, which we were never going to do, literally no. it was go sit and wear your XPW shirts in the front row. Get people going, why is XPW there? What is XPW there? What's XPW's next move? Let me go and look up XPW and, oh, they have a show coming up. You know, that, that was the whole goal of it all. Whole goal of it all. Um, and they turned it into something way bigger than it would have been. I mean, if we had just been there in our T-shirts and then moved on, it would not live on an infamy it would not get millions of right. views on WWE.com. Uh, you know, it would have been dead and over. And it's, and it's, I think it's like what, one of the, the, the highest paid, the, the highest played ECW event on the network, I believe too, if I'm not mistaken. I could but, not um, tell you that. But it wouldn't yeah, surprise me. Uh, but, um, but that was, um, that was going, going into the, um, into the, after the heat wave incident happened, not only were we getting wrestlers from ECW, but here we end up now, XPW ends up at the Grand Olympic Auditorium. Again, another, another tremendous feat. I mean, for me personally, I'll always hold the sports arena as my favorite because that's where I grew up. But I also understand the history of the Grand Olympic Auditorium. The Grand Olympic Auditorium, we go way back. I mean, we're talking like the advent of wrestling on television in the United States, the days of Gorgeous George, Baron Leone, all that. There is so much history with Hollywood wrestling in the uh, uh, Grand Olympic Auditorium that, again, it was just another honor to be a part of this. And to there was a little bit of uh, some pride there because we ended up at the Grand Olympic Auditorium after ECW was was gone. You know, and, and but but not not again – this is not like they're worse, we're better. It was just uh, from a personal standpoint, you know, we, 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 we worked a lot for this, you know, and we believed in this and we, and we got here and we're here. And I think that's when you started to see some of the West coast fans start to be like, okay, it was fashionable to hate XPW and how dare them do that to my beloved ECW. But you know what? This is, this is my league. This is the West Coast. This is my fed as a as an Angelino or or a West Coast extreme wrestling fan or whatever. It was like and that and that's why when I was telling you earlier, like how I talked to some people and they were uh, glorifying uh, XPW's involvement in Heat Wave. They were almost like, "What was I doing? What was I doing? Like I had my own league out here. Uh, why was I loyal to ECW, especially now?" Because back in the day, people didn't know. It, they kayfabe that to death that WWF's involvement with ECW was going on at that time. And not a lot of people oh, yeah. knew that. Had they known that, it's like, really, this is that alternative league that you're paying attention to? No, we were the true alternative league. We didn't have um, – we had the storyline of Uncle Eric with Rob. That was storyline <laughs> that WCW was our big brother. But that wasn't even true. Yeah. Well, and, yeah, and, and, so, and, and so XPW was the was a true independent source of wrestling, whereas ECW look back, and I think that's why when I was telling you I hear this now, I think that's why when people bring it up and they understand, oh, Vince was involved with ECW, oh, you know, XPW really was that uh, the black sheep of the wrestling world in, in a way, you know. Yeah, and I, well, I think with the Olympic, it was to me that's still my my most favorite venue um, because. It, it it was it was made for for wrestling and it was right. uh it was great um and uh, yeah so I mean as much as it was awesome to run the sports arena because that's where I you know, grew up watching wrestling um mm-hmm. yeah I mean the Olympic uh, I don't think you could not touch that it was just perfect it was the perfect venue for wrestling and I think too like you mentioned you know that was really also when we kind of started to hit our stride as a promotion um you know that was where we really. And you know, where we have those mm-hmm. red pro opening matches that mm-hmm. change the SoCal scene um, in terms of exposing the, the, you know, we were, yes, we were an independent group, but there was this whole other level of independence under us yeah, that were like right. the, the really kind of the small locals that weren't on TV and weren't traveling and some that. And, you know, uh, we were putting on really good shows from top to bottom 
uh, at the Olympic. Um, yeah, those, those Olympic, was, those, I was going to say yeah. those Olympic shows are some of the, just great from top to bottom. I remember matches with uh, Dynamite D and um, Dynamite D and um, uh, what was it? Chaos. Yeah, Chaos was, D uh, had a great match there. Yep. Yeah, and um, and so uh, a lot of great and our stars shined. You know, and I think, like you said, we we hit our stride. You know, yep. we hit our stride with um, we're really coming into our own right there. The television product was getting a lot cleaner, a lot better, and um, Everything was kind of gelling at that point in time. Um, but we definitely had our detractors. And before we went to uh, the Grand Olympic Auditorium, we were wrestling at Birmingham High School in Van Nuys, California, Patriot and Hall. those are great shows, too. Those are, those are great, great shows, shows. too. I, I just looking back, like it would have been nice to have um, a longer run at the L.A. Sports Arena for sure. But, you know, his, his the rest is history. But um Get, we but talk about a little bit about what we did at Birmingham High and how we got the big boot, which I guess was a blessing in disguise going into the Olympic Auditorium. Yeah, so Olympic, uh, so Birmingham High was a was a pretty big size high school in the San Fernando Valley, uh, and it was pretty amazing that we got to run there as long as we did. Um, you know, we had a great deal with the athletic department there. You know, we were helping. Essentially, our shows were fundraisers for the athletic department yeah. in terms of you know our, our rental fee and this and that um but we were going into high school and we were doing these crazy blood and gut shows and fire uh yeah fire. 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 Things on fire. i mean just that my dad uh was at the time probably i think at that time probably a principal uh, in a different school district he would have never <laughs> let us do this at his school uh you know his own son after, his own son. after after losing this rob was like you had to print when you hit up your dad i'm like this is not gonna happen um but eventually <laughs> what happened basically was that um i don't remember if it was a superintendent or but somebody basically said that they didn't want to be whoring themselves out to this wrestling company while preaching don't be violent in school and you know it just it <laughs> wasn't what it wasn't the type of business basically that, that they wanted the school um to be doing uh and so we lost we lost uh, the venue uh, which sucked at the time but like you said ended up working out in the end bring it bring it bring it back to the grand olympic auditorium talk a little bit about when new jack first came into xpw uh like i said there's a lot of been uh, peak uh, uh revived interest in xpw after new jack's dark side of the ring and i think the two topics really was that and of course uh, people paying tribute to Lester, the late great Supreme, and and in in recent months, people have uh, been contacting me. I'm sure contacting you and anybody that was involved in XPW, and wanting to basically hear some of these stories. But um, I never. I, that was your department, New Jack, of course, coming in. And um, what was it like? Uh, again, this wasn't too long after the heat wave incident. Ah, uh, well, New Jack and I have had quite a relationship on and off over the last 20 years. <laughs> um, you know, you talk about real. There right. is nobody more real than New Jack. Um, totally. Uh, you know, it, it, and, and it's, that's the positive and the negative of it, right? The positive right. is you right. put him on TV and he is going to give you that realism. You know, I, I, I tell people all the time, especially now in, in this era of wrestling. We're not where we were 30, 30 years ago. It's not about convincing people that what they see is 100% real. Everyone knows it's not 100% real. The, the challenge is, can you convince people that it's 1% real, that there's something real that they're watching, that there's some chance that these guys don't like each other, some chance that something might go away that you're not expecting it to go. And uh, with New Jack, you get that. You absolutely get that. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, that's, that's New Jack. He was, he was uh, a lot to work with. And, um, you know, you took, you took the good with the bad, you know, whether it was XPW or WSX or the, the bounty hunting TV show that we were trying to do that almost you know, basically got sold and oh, then never yeah. happened. That big vision. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the man drew, he was, I would say, if you look at like the most popular wrestlers in the history of XPW, certainly of the most popular, um, 
uh, non XBW regionals. Jack was right up there. Um, and, uh, we, we, we had a lot of good programs with him and uh, obviously, you know, the, the free fall event, which is what you're referencing that was talked about on the dark side of the ring was uh, huge, uh, you know, uh, for us for a number of reasons, but it, it definitely became one of the most historic best selling DVDs, uh, you know, really, uh, really uh, people remember that, uh, amongst yeah. some of the, the biggest things of, of XPW. Just to just to clarify for fans, XPW's free fall took place at the Grand Olympic Auditorium in 2001. And wow, uh, great shot. yeah, great shot right there. Uh, thanks to our producer, George Moza. But uh, uh, back in 2001, this took place. And um, this was at the Grand Olympic Auditorium once again. And this was kind of a a continuation of their feud in ECW and running out the storyline from when uh, they kind of had a botch spot where Grimes fell on Jack's head and he was never the same uh, medically ever since then, you know, but um, so this was kind of a highly anticipated match. Now talk a little bit about, because I remember when I was there and how, uh, talk, like you said, talk about real, Oh my goodness. Like, Everybody felt like these guys are really going to go out there and and do some damage because all I remember is Vic Grimes by himself, kind of pacing nervously, and I remember Jack uh, to the on the opposite side of the curtain as Gorilla, just kind of sitting in a chair with all his weapons around him, just by himself, like almost like meditating in a way, uh, with with uh, uh, with like vengeance in his eyes, so to speak. But um, um. I just remember everybody was like, it was a, it was an eerie night. It was, but even before it happened, it was just very eerie. It was like, um, it was, it was like nothing even in the back, back in wrestling in, in the backstage that we never, I've never really felt or seen before that event. No. And I think, you know, when I say that there was a level of realism to it, I don't just mean on camera. I right. mean, behind yep, the yep. scenes as well totally. you know obviously oh, the yeah. two agreed they agreed to have the match um yeah. you know no there's never been a single match in xpw where somebody was completely against doing it we forced someone to do it you, i mean you, you can't do that uh so they they agreed to have the match but let me tell you you don't walk up to new jack and ask him like oh so like what you know what do you think you're gonna do or how's this gonna go or let me make sure you're not going to really hurt. But like you don't, you don't do that. Um, yeah. And you know they had conversation. Never, really, never, ever after that even got details of their conversation they had. Um, you know, you just you want to walk up to me, Jack, and ask him details about it. You go yeah. right ahead. I won't be right. doing that. Um, but so just to, I mean, so just to clarify, the, just to clarify for the fans, Kevin. So you're saying that uh, as the Booker, as the um, you know, uh, putting all the matches together, you personally didn't have a conversation. Let's say the three of you or with Rob, the four of you, it was just Grimes and Jack. No, I mean, obviously we had a clear direction for a finish, but beyond that, you know, we, we, we didn't Mike, that wasn't a match that you would agent or micromanage or have somebody in the middle of, you know, you had those two guys and, and they were going to go out there and do what they were going to do. Um, mm -hmm. so it wasn't a, you know, it was not a traditional, uh, traditional match where, you know, you, you talk about more details than you, there was no, there were no details to talk about. They're going to go out there and they were going to have a fight. And, um, and, and like, like you would have been involved with saying the formalities of putting the match together, what the finish was, but then everything else in between, it was all them. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 There, there, was, and, and, there was, I mean, honestly, that was the, that wasn't abnormal for a new Jack match. Right, um, right. You know what I mean? Like that was, that was how a new Jack match went, you know, here's, here's, here's the match. Here's the finish. Uh, you know, and that was it. And Jack took yeah. it from there. Um, you know, so, um, what can you, what, yeah, can that, you say, what, what can you, what can you say about the match? If you know, what did Vic Grimes know? What did he not know? And, Vic has always said that he didn't know that Jack was going to use the stun gun. I remember that. Uh, that, that he got. Um, and 
then you know, thank God Vinny Massaro had us move the ring the way the way that we did and push it out because Vic fell. Uh, sure. That was like one of the scariest moments of my life. Uh, he, yeah. you know, he hit the top rope, and in, thank God it flung him into the ring instead of out of the ring. Uh, because I don't know, I don't know what would happen if he landed on that concrete, uh, or that was, or or land uh, on a couple ringsiders. Yeah, who yeah. knows? Uh, I mean, there was, was so there were so many variables to that match, and I remember. Yeah. We usually called the action in in the um, in the edit bay uh, post production, but uh, and some of them we called live. And this one we were calling live. And I remember, like, okay, I'm gonna get ready to do my my scream. I did. I had like ah, you know, went, ah, when people would fall, right, or, or something extreme would happen. But I remember, like, when that happened, I, I was like, half of that was real, and half was just to do it. I remember doing the scream and then just throwing the headphones headset down like almost like frozen like what the fuck just happened like there was something in the air to where like i knew i knew and felt like this is this is a beyond historical moment we're we're in right now and and say what you want about xpw or even that moment it 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 definitely is probably in the top 10 most horrific or horrifying or extreme or craziest, whatever you want to call it moments oh, yeah. in pro wrestling history. And, and that's the feeling that I felt right there. There was all sorts of emotions. There was that there was, what have we come to? Like, what are we <laughs> doing? How did we get to this level? And of course the ultimate question is like, we did not know if the guy was dead. I guess that really? was running out, me running out there to check on him was legit one of the scariest moments yeah. of my life. We, we, I remember where the, the, where we were sitting broadcast, uh, not Rivera, one Tastico at the time, but we were, we just took our headphones down and went up as far as we could to the railing and just like, like, and people, it was just, I don't, I don't know how to explain the controlled chaotic feeling of the fans. It was nothing. It was just so thick in there that night that the, the feeling after he came down and like no one knew whether to be relieved or what happened. There was so much craziness and emotion going on. And again, this is all while not only us, but the fans did not know if this guy was going to die. It was it was so intense. It was so crazy. And I've never been a part of anything like that before or since. And it was like, Wow. Like, I, I mean, I'm still thinking about it, like, like looking back at that moment, like one, how lucky was, was Vic Grimes and, and, and how, how that was pulled off. And, and I don't know, man, like, what did that mean for XBW or did it mean anything for us or, or, or was it just another moment in, in time in wrestling history that it kind of like out, out, out does what we were doing in a way. I don't know. It's, but it's definitely there. People still talk about that, you know. Yeah, and I, it, uh, and, mm -hmm. and I, I so, and and Vic, uh, Vic became uh, a really important person in my life. So I'm glad that uh, he was okay that night. Very glad he was okay that by night. By the way, by the way, one of the best guys ever. One of the sweetest, greatest dudes you'll ever meet. He, yeah. He's just—he's uh, an awesome guy. He's—he's he's all around nice, nice, good, good dude. Yes. When I uh, when I left Los Angeles, um, took a detour to Arizona, and then had to move up here to uh, the Bay Area, um, Vic helped me find my first apartment up here. Uh, and then when I was having some other uh, problems um, uh, because of the collapse of of uh of, of the vision um yeah you know, he mm -hmm. he helped me when i needed help the most and uh we've remained in contact i just attended his uh his uh 50th birthday party wow that was awesome, 50th, right 50th, yeah 50th birthday party uh <laughs> earlier this year happy um, birthday Vic. pre-covid thankfully mm -hmm. um and uh yeah no he's uh really really glad that he was okay that night for multiple oh, yeah. reasons uh, but he's uh, he's just become such a such a good person. Yeah. Well, Kevin, I mean, um, I want to thank you for your time. But before we before we wrap this up, um, 
maybe we can save this for another time, but just as many stories as there are uh, in front of the camera with XPW and all the things that went down, there are so many stories behind the camera, not at necessarily the XPW events, but at the XPW offices and all the craziness that went on. And, you know, it's public knowledge now, but I mean, we were living and working in talk about the Wild West. I mean, I can tell people stories and they just like, nah, they don't believe me. <laughs> they, they, they don't believe me. It's no different than telling people if you know the movie uh, Windy City Heat and the, mm -hmm. the, guy that, the guy that they made fun of, um, who, who, I, who I actually became friends, by the way, Kevin, with, with Don Barris, because I ran into him at KLOS. Uh, so I told Don about, if if anyone knows that movie, check it out. It's a cult classic. Yeah, check it and out. The, it was, and, uh, and it's so it, true it's one of the funniest <laughs> things I've ever seen in my life to this day. And and the guy who they pay, played a prank on, uh, Perry Carabello, he used to stand on the corner in a diaper and shout in the bullhorn that XPW is here. That's what we paid him not, to do. Not and hired or asked to do no, that, let's be clear. No, he would just do that. And then this guy is real. So people that watch Windy City Heat that I tell like, no, this is real. Nah, that can't be real. That's <laughs> it. So, so it's the same thing with like stories about XPW, Rob, the offices and all that. And, and personally, I, I, I can tell these stories if I want. I enjoy talking about the wrestling more. But but a lot of people do want to know about like stuff that happened in the office uh, behind the scenes and the wild, the wild, chaotic, uh, crazy things that they could have filmed a movie about just uh, a normal day at the XPW offices. But I mean, I, I mean, I, I remember one story where uh, we were we were all um, getting ready to do wraparounds and and back in those days, like. We would come into the office on a Wednesday night to tape the Saturday's uh, television show, but Rob would take his sweet time sometimes and make us wait <laughs> until like two, three in the morning. So I remember going into one of the side rooms and there was a couch and I took a nap. All right. I took a nap. Oh yeah. A special guest right there. Cool. Yes. <laughs> but um, I took a nap in one of the side rooms on the couch and then I woke up and no one was in the office. It was totally vacant. <laughs> And I was like, okay, what's going on? And I remember going around to, through like the kitchen area to the office, it's a Rob's office and no one was in there. Uh, I say hello and here comes Tom Byron uh, out from under his desk with a pistol. <laughs> and he goes, are they gone yet? And I'm like, who? And, and he was telling me there were two guys here looking for so Rob, whatever, and I was, they probably came into that room and saw me and I was asleep on that couch and they just left. And then oh, Rob came in. And you came, uh, this was, uh, I was, I was toward the back, like one, one this was the second no, office. No, which, the, the oh, the one, ben, ben Owen. North Hollywood. Okay, yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah the, the one that we had till the end. Yes, right. And so, yeah. so, so I come in and, and, and this was like, you know, there's, white powdery stuff all over the desk. It was right out of Scarface, man. And, uh, and, and I remember, are they, are these guys gone? And I'm like, who? And then Rob comes in and then you come in and then Tom's like, Hey, I guess they're gone. And Rob goes, all right, let's go film the fucking wraparounds. Like nothing Dude, happened. So, so, so yeah, so there were, there were some guys that had come in earlier in the day, apparently like casing the joint. Uh, and they, they came back that night with, with guns. Uh, and and tried to rob the place, and we all just kind of went and scattered into into offices. Um, and yeah, it was it was definitely crazy. I, I I was I was snoozing that whole time. I mean, they could have <laughs> uh, maybe they tried to go for my wallet. I don't know, but I just woke up and I guess it was oh, done. And, and but but I love I love Rob's uh, Rob's. Uh, <laughs> it was on with the show. Her, yeah yeah yeah. Just huh? okay. Let's go. Let's go do the, let's go to wrap around like this. Like this is what's important right here. Uh, and we and but, but, people, I mean, the we this is this is the funny thing, right? Like working working for Rob. Not not just for, working for Rob, working XPW, working these literally we work twenty hours a day. There were yeah. there were I mean that was our life at that point. We were working like twenty hour days. And 
you know, Rob, I don't think I'm telling anyone anything that Rob wouldn't say. Rob was, was a very, I don't know, demanding is not the word, but like, it was not easy to work for Rob. You know, there was a mm-hmm. lot of demands. Um, and even if it was just the fact that like, you know, I used to sleep with my pager, pager, that's how old we are, my pager yeah. under my pillow. Because if yeah. he needed something at, you know, midnight or midnight, we weren't even probably home, but like, it could have been a weekend at, you know, six in the morning, whatever. Um, you know, uh, he texted me and I'd call him and we, we to work on whatever. And so, you know, I, I've had these other kind of jobs, uh, you know, since then, or, you know, uh, where I work in these high stress environments and people are always like, how do you, <laughs> yeah. like, you never yeah. seem like you're stressed. You never seem like, yes, I got the really hard job out of the way first so that everything else in life seemed, seems pretty easy. Completely. And, and I, I remember working jobs too, where it was like, this is nothing, man. This is no. nothing compared to what, you know, what we, what we dealt with in the office. And it was and very it, politically incorrect. Let me tell you. Ah, oh, it was yeah. politically. <laughs> yeah. It was politically incorrect. It was. Even for know, back then, it, it was politically incorrect. It had a great soundtrack because there was always, you know, Metallica or, you know, right. this or that cranking through the office. Um, yeah. It was fun. Uh, you know, we, 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 you and, and, the thing, you know, uh, if if you were one of the people that was loyal to Rob, he took care of you. Um, you know, uh, it, there was there was uh, you know bouts of, of of differences, and not to say that he couldn't be a hothead, but um, you know, people kind of rode different waves of of uh, in favor with and out of favor with, but um, yeah. Uh, it was it was unlike anything else uh, I've ever experienced, and it led. Same look, here. I mean, there's there's no way you know. I'm not here today, still working in wrestling and having Master Public today, or there would have never been Wrestling Society X. None of that happens right. without a community. Um, totally, you know. And totally. so, uh, as as and we and, our, and that's well, right? that's to thank you, man, and thank you and Rob for that, man, because you gave a lot of guys opportunities. I mean, I. I still get, I still get calls every now and again to do a wrestling show for someone or call call some matches. It's like, you know, that little blip on the radar that we were, uh, that that lasts, you know. And we can't tell you how much not only you guys but all the fans out there that still talk about this, remember this, and and we're fans of of XPW Wrestling Society X and all that. And and there's been like grassroots online campaigns, you know, people always wanting to bring it back and. And uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping, I know Rob, Rob has been trying to, um, you know, figure out, I think, a way. It, Rob's in contact with the people that bought XGW originally, and he's been granted permission to, you know, do what he wants. Um, you know, he's got some great ideas about, uh, you know, how he sees potentially doing something in the future. Um, I, guess I, I personally would just love to see a way that the library was accessible. So like we talked right. about, you know, earlier people could go back and actually see it with fresh eyes and you know watch yeah. those tv episodes and you know watch 130 plus weeks of tv and what we did um because there's some really good stuff there uh, and i think we and i think we uh it was we were all so young then it was such a learning learning curve for us and we've all evolved so much more so oh, it's yeah. interesting to see everybody's input now uh, on yeah, the wrestling business but that, the wrestling that, 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 that we're going to cringe at uh but i do i think that um you know, I can say, especially in terms of storylines, character development, uh, define characters who could all cut, you who would all cut good promos that helped define their characters, that helped promote stories, that helped push, you know, the the evolution of feuds. Um, everything had a purpose. Everything uh, was done for a reason. Everything tied to something else and was you know cohesive and consistent and you don't i even in wwe today you do not find that level of storytelling Um, totally so i remain very proud of that kevin we got so much more to talk about let's let's bring you back on in the near future to continue this conversation and and maybe not just this conversation but then we can maybe dive into mass republic we can dive into speaking of wrestling society x can we please see that t-shirt Yes, see, it's we, like we, uh, we, 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 it's fast, die young, wrestling society. Yeah, dude. You so. can get this uh, at 
pro wrestling tees. You can find four, four, four different uh, uh, t-shirts at prowrestlingtees.com slash WSX. I don't even have one of those shirts, man. How is that possible? So I got to get one of those for sure. Here's the thing. I put these up for the 10th anniversary like um, a couple years ago. I mm-hmm. just two weeks ago bought one myself finally. And oh. I, I'm wearing it because it literally just came in the mail yesterday. <laughs> All right, cool, man. Well, we'll, we'll definitely, we'll definitely talk because uh, from what we see, people writing in and they 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 pretty much want to hear about WSX just as much as they do about XPW. Some of the same people, some just totally different people. And like you said before, a lot of people internationally uh, asking about both companies, which is so cool to see. You know, people from Europe, Australia, um, Asia, uh, South Central South America, of course, but. Um, uh, it's very, very cool to see that uh, fan base still alive and and remembering that, you know, kind of like uh, remembering a- any other league that's defunct now in professional wrestling. Like as a wrestling fan, I still remember Global Wrestling Federation. So why not remember WSX and all that? But hey, Kevin, it's it's oh, I think I'm done. My mic's on. Can you hear me? <laughs> OK, cool. All right. So we're we're going to sign off. But Kevin, again, man. You and I, we go back so far. We we barely scratch the surface, man, because yeah. like you said, we, we go back before XPW, before SCCW, into the Slammer, Slammer's wrestling gym days. And uh, it's just a really, really pleasure to get back in touch with you, uh, my friend, and also to, uh, to just like take a stroll down memory lane. A lot of fun. And I hope we answered a lot of fans' questions out there uh, that have been writing in and just want certain things that they what they want to know about xpw and everybody else that was writing about wsx hopefully that'll happen sooner than later so my name is chris claus and again kevin any parting words for the fans out there uh thank you uh, if you actually watched us talk about xpw for two hours and i appreciate uh <laughs> you know that you that you were interested in the topic um uh if you want to know what's uh, going on today then uh at mask m-a-s-k-e-d republic for uh on all social media for what i'm doing in wrestling these days and for the last 10 years um and uh it was great to talk to you chris yeah i think uh 28 years since we probably first met that's a long oh, time wow. uh, i can't believe that man uh, uh but yeah no, it, was, uh, it was really good to talk to you and uh, yeah, I you too, man. To, uh come back in the future all right let's do it again and for everybody thank you for joining us on extreme memories here on the wrestling chatter channel for kevin kleinrock my name is chris Kloss. thank you and we'll see you next time thank you thank you for watching extreme memories hosted by chris Kloss. he's dropping new episodes every month on the 15th and 30th you can be the first to tune in by subscribing to the wrestling chatter channel right here on youtube see you next time